Ladies and gentlemen, given what growing up with one sibling taught me about negotiation, conflict resolution, and diplomacy, I can only imagine the rich opportunities for leadership development provided to our Premier growing up in a family of 10 children. While Ontario's 24th Premier credits his parents for teaching him the values and ethics that guide him as leader, I suspect his siblings had a lot of influence as well. It's quite evident, evident that those life skills have served him well during his 21 years in provincial politics. I don't suppose Alberta's Ralph Goodall consulted the McGinty family back in 2003 before coining the name Flinty McGinty, nor did McLean seek permission to use the term Mr. Ontario, both in reference to our Premier's determination and tenacity in negotiating Ontario's stake in the First Minister's Accord on health care renewal. With Ontario's call to the polls twice this year, the stake of our province in the Federation and of the Federation in our province is a matter of current and critical importance. The Honourable Dalton McGuinty, Premier of Ontario, has addressed the Canadian Club of Toronto five times since 1999, on four of those occasions as Premier. Allow me to state the obvious by saying that Premier McGuinty has had a busy time. Health care, education, the economy and services for Ontario families have been major focal points under his leadership. And change has been a recurring theme in the Premier's efforts. Class sizes and hospital wait times have been reduced, the province's infrastructure has been strengthened, and billions of dollars of new investment have found a home here. Given Ontario's size and contribution to Canada's vitality, our provincial government is constantly under the watchful eye of forecasters, analysts, critics, and of course, the public. Not even the slightest policy change, nor hint of one, goes by unnoticed. Economic stimulus has been the mantra of the day, and the Open Ontario Plan has stimulated new possibilities. Full-day kindergarten, new post-secondary education spaces, and investment in clean energy and water technology are also among the accomplishments of this provincial government. Premier McGuinty, we know you to be thoughtful and deliberate about your words and actions, and the timing of both. We are grateful you've chosen the Canadian Club of Toronto to deliver today's remarks, and we are anxious to hear what you have to say. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Premier Dalton McGuinty to the Canadian Club podium. Prime Minister John Turner, the Honourable Bob Ray, Distinguished guests, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Ontarians. Uh, Nick, thanks so much for that very kind, uh, very eloquent, very thoughtful introduction. It's been said that what, what's bred in the bone will out in the flesh. You cannot escape your destiny. Sooner or later, you will run for me. Your mother served us well. Stop struggling. I tried that for a while. It doesn't work. Thanks to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be here today. You no doubt have other pressing priorities, unless you play for the Sands of the Leafs. In that case, thanks for coming out. It's been a tough year for hockey fans. For a while there, it looked like there was some light at the end of the tunnel, but that tunnel turned out to be Zamboni headlights. <laughs> the great thing about hockey is that there's always a next season and hope springs eternal. Chers amis, c'est un grand plaisir que d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Nous sommes bien sûr en plein milieu d'une importante campagne électorale fédérale fort occupée. Et en tant qu'une province la plus populeuse du Canada, Et en tant que locomotive de l'économie canadienne, cette élection revêt une importance particulière pour les Ontariennes 
the Ontarien. We find ourselves in the middle of a very busy and important federal election. And as Canada's largest province and the engine of the Canadian economy, this, this election means a lot to Ontarians. Like you, I'm following the campaign with a great deal of interest and perhaps more so than ever before with a quiet pride. I feel privileged to live in a country where we can debate the issues, question the candidates, and make our choices in peace and freedom with no one vote counting for more than any other. There are, as you well know, other places in the world where people are struggling, even giving up their lives for this beautiful gift of democracy that you and I have inherited. And no matter what our politics, I think we can all agree we are truly blessed. Of course, there's always all kinds of fun to be had during the course of an election, to had during the course of an election. I, uh, a couple of elections ago, I was out with my brother, David. Uh, it was his turn. We popped in at the St. Patrick's long-term care home. They told us that we could chat with the residents after lunch. So we took them up on that offer. The residents had, in fact, had their lunch, and they were in the sunroom. So I wasn't sure how many, in fact, were going to be able to listen to us. So I nonetheless introduced my brother David with a great deal of enthusiasm. David stands up and says, uh, it's great to be here. I got to tell you, I've been knocking on thousands of doors here in Ottawa South. And he proudly held up his right hand knuckles, visibly bruised with all that door knocking. And then he proceeded to say, you know, you learn a lot when you knock on that many doors. In that very moment, an elderly woman who appeared to be fast asleep lifts up her head from the pillow and says, too bad you didn't learn to knock with your left hand. <laughs> you know, every time we enter an election season, we're reminded of a fundamental truth about democracy. The people are always right. In elections, the people get to have the final say on the issues that matter most to them. For decades now, there's been one particular issue of concern to Ontarians and Canadians that has always been top of mind, health care. We seek the security of quality, publicly funded, universally accessible health care. We want to live our lives secure in the knowledge that should we become sick and end up in a hospital, or if a loved one should become ill, there will be quality care for us. We won't have to fend for ourselves. We won't be on our own. Our health care system is a very important part of what it means to be Canadian. It means that if you're sick, that's all that counts. We're there for you. It doesn't matter how much money or influence you might have. If you're sick, we're there for you. That's the deal. I want my kids and my grandkids to have that certainty too. I want them to live in that kind of country. And that, my friends, is going to take some work. People know our health care costs keep going up. They keep taking up a rising share of provincial budgets. 20 years ago, 32 cents of every dollar we spent on government programs went into health care. Today, it's 46 cents of every dollar. And as we baby boomers get on in our years, we'll be putting even more pressure on the system. So Canadians want to hear not only what, that we're committed to Medicare, they want to see a credible plan to guarantee its survival. So I was pleased to see that three weeks into the federal election campaign, the talk finally turned to the future of health care. It was a good start, but I believe we need a much broader discussion. And this campaign provides an opportunity for federal parties to share their vision for the future of Medicare. Right now, I would suggest that vision is lacking. Much of the talk so far has only been about a two-year commitment which might be adequate for now, but provides no framework for the future. I mean, what happens after two years? Is it another two-year commitment? How are we going to build Medicare for the long road ahead when we're taking such short, tentative steps today? To get to our destination, we need a roadmap. Canadians need to see a roadmap for the future of our Medicare. That means looking beyond a two-year funding plan and creating a new 10-year vision. We know it's possible. We're not shooting for the moon here. 
We did it in 2004, so we can do it again. I believe we need to begin this process, this national discussion, right away, and that we should have a new health accord by the end of 2012. Why would we wait until 2014 when there is so much work to be done to strengthen Medicare? We need to get to it, and the sooner, the better. To get that new agreement, we need three things. First, we need a federal government delivering on the strong funding commitments made during this campaign. Second, we need a federal government leading a national discussion on how we can strengthen Medicare for the future. And finally, those discussions must lead to a new 10-year health accord negotiated among provinces and territories with priorities, accountability, and clear goals. The federal funding commitments made during this campaign are important and appreciated. Keep in mind, the federal government only contributes 23 cents of every dollar spent on health care in Ontario. The province pays the rest. Setting aside that issue for the time being, there's another way the federal government must contribute. And for Ontarians, this is a non-negotiable. The federal government's commitment to high-quality, publicly funded, universally accessible Medicare must be strong and unwavering. <laughs> there can be no buckling, no bending. Don't get me wrong. We're open to all kinds of change in health care, all kinds of innovation, but within Medicare, not outside of it. I'm optimistic about a new accord, as I say we did it before. I was part of the negotiation in 2004 that led to that health accord. All of us, the premiers, the prime minister, were holed up in 24 Sussex until the early hours of the morning. It wasn't easy, at times it wasn't pretty, but we never let up and we never gave up. We produced a comprehensive 10-year agreement that led to real positive change. We left that meeting tired, but we also left with a commitment a commitment made by the federal government to fund shorter wait times for all Canadians. That was progress for all of us, but there was unfinished business for our province. Like the other provinces, we were getting more money for health care, but unlike the other provinces, we were getting less than our fair share. Ontario governments had rightly been pressing our case with Ottawa for over 20 years, and for the first time, just a few years ago, we got a yes in response. An acknowledgement that, yes, Ontarians must get the same level of support as Canadians and other provinces. So, that combination of a new national health accord, together with fair treatment for Ontario, set the stage for real, positive, meaningful change in health care. This stability, predictability and accountability, this along with our investments, allowed Ontarians to achieve outstanding results. I'll list just a few. We've built 13 new hospitals. Five more are under construction. We've hired over 11,000 new nurses and nearly 2,900 more doctors. We've gone from zero to 200 family health teams who will serve 3 million people. We're opening, first of their kind in North America, 25 nurse practitioner-led clinics to serve over 40,000 Ontarians who didn't have access to family care. Now, you might say those are inputs. So what are we getting? These investments have made a real difference, a real measurable difference in people's lives. Today, for example, 94% of all Ontarians have access to a family doctor. That's 1.2 million more people than in 2003. And before, we didn't even measure wait times. Now we lead the country in wait times in many key procedures. But the truth is, we've only just begun our health care reforms. And if you stop and think about it, we've only scratched the surface when it comes to helping Ontarians who want to lead healthier lives. That's why I'm calling for a new 10-year accord, because we need to get at this work together right away. Nous avons besoin de signatures au bas de cette entente et qu'elle entre en vigueur, de telle sorte que les provinces, comme l'Ontario, puissent avoir des certitudes pour pouvoir commencer à faire des réformes, des réformes fondamentales. Ceci assurera l'avenir de notre réseau de santé pour tous et toutes, peu importe où vous vivez, ce que vous faites ou combien vous gagnez.
We need the signatures on the bottom line and the agreement in place so that provinces like Ontario have the certainty to begin making the fundamental reforms that will secure the future of our health care system for everyone, no matter where you live, what you do, or how much you make, and so that families can plan their own futures, knowing this vital service will be there when they need it, regardless of their ability to pay. I see this as an exciting time for Canadian health care. Ontarians, and I believe all Canadians, are eager for change, the kind of change that takes advantage of innovation, to improve the quality of our health care and increase the efficiency of the system. But Ontarians want to repeat. They insist that those changes be made within our public health care system. Those are exactly the kinds of changes we've been making together here in Ontario for eight years now. Let me give you just a few examples. By providing more bariatric surgeries in Ontario instead of the U.S., we've cut the price of them in half. By adopting best practices, like the ones related to wound care as developed by our own nurses, we improve quality of care and save thousands of dollars per patient. By taking the drug cost bull by the horns and passing a new law in Ontario, we cut the price of generic drugs in half, saving half a billion dollars every year. That's allowing us to fund new drugs to cover more diseases. We're creating an electronic health registry as a foundation for better, faster care. In 2006, fewer than 800,000 Ontarians had an electronic medical record. Today, the number is 7 million. In 2012, it will be 10 million. My point is there are many savings, improvements, and efficiencies to be found in the way we deliver health care. The 2004 Health Accord included a number of measures to help provinces achieve that kind of progress together. Some of that work is unfinished. For example, the Accord called for us to work on creating a national pharmaceuticals strategy. This would ensure that all Canadians have access to the same drugs. That's only fair. And this would ensure all the provinces and territories purchase our drugs together to get the best price. That's only smart. The 2004 Accord also called for coordinated action on another important health issue facing our country, improving home care services. According to the Canadian Institute for Health Information, seniors account for 14% of the population, but 44% of our health care expenditures. A renewed 10-year health accord will help us continue moving forward in these and other important areas. I want you to know, I am confident we can keep building Medicare for the future through collaboration and innovation. I had the opportunity to study biology for four years before I went to law school. Something you come to understand. Human beings are the only species blessed with the power of imagination. There is no end to what we can accomplish should we turn our minds to it and stay focused and deliberate and determined and become resourceful. So imagine if 13 million Ontarians, better still, 34 million Canadians, committed themselves to pursuing relentlessly reforms and innovation to be found within Medicare. I'm telling you, we owe this to ourselves, we owe it to our children, we owe it to our grandchildren, and we owe it to the rest of the world because they too struggle with health care costs. Why can't we stand as a shining example of what can be done when it comes to preserving something so precious? You know, I, I think it's kind of interesting. Those proposing some level of private care have somehow claimed the mantle of innovators. But making people pay for care and fend for themselves, that's one of the oldest ideas in the book. The truth is, 21st century defenders of Medicare are champions of innovation. We have an abiding faith in our ability to work creatively together to make a great idea even better. And what is Medicare if not one of the most courageous, creative, and visionary ideas that we ever dreamt up as a nation? So fighting to save Medicare is fighting for change. <laughs> fighting for Medicare is fighting for change. Positive, relentless, constructive change. So let's get the leaders in a room. Let's share ideas. Let's focus on goals. Let's agree to solutions. 
If you look back at our history, there are countless examples of how we moved our country forward by coming together, agreeing to principles, and taking concerted action. The very creation of our country came about in that way. Consensus building is what we do. It's who we are. It's us at our best. It's how we'll continue building a great country. Ontarians look forward to building Medicare for the future. And we have other issues, too, we are eager to take up with the federal government. We look for Ottawa's support as we invest in our clean energy sector. We look for fair support for our immigrants. We look to repair an equalization system that last year required Ontario taxpayers to transfer a net $5 billion to the rest of the country. And we look for our fair share of seats in the House of Commons so we can continue to be a strong partner in Confederation. And there's only one way to resolve these issues together as partners. A predecessor of mine, Premier John Robarts, put it this way nearly a half century ago. The mere discovery that there are some cracks and crevices in the edifice of our Confederation should not cause us to flee and panic and abandon our century-old home. Rather, let us proceed as good craftsmen and overcome these defects and make it a more durable dwelling. My friends, that is the challenge and the opportunity before us today. You need to know something. Throughout our history, Ontarians have been builders with tools at the ready. We have them in hand, and we are eager to get to work, eager to rebuild our Medicare for the 21st century, eager to work with our fellow Canadians, and determined to build a stronger Ontario for a stronger Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Premier McGinty. I'd like to welcome Alan Odette to our podium. Thanks, Nick. This is now the sixth time. Uh, Premier, uh, this is now your sixth time uh, appearing here at the Canadian Club of Toronto, and you continue to inspire us uh, and offer your reassuring perspective about the future uh, of our province, and for that, thank you. Your plan for Ontario maps out a route uh, for prosperity that is grounded in addressing the needs of the young, the old, the rich and the poor, the skilled and the unskilled. Since 2003, we have been impressed by your confident and compassionate approach to leadership in this, our country's most populous province. You've remained calm, cool and collected even when circumstances would have allowed you to be otherwise. Mr. Premier, as you prepare to hit the campaign trail uh, in the months ahead, uh, I join with those attending today in wishing you luck as you visit the many towns and villages across our province. I'm sure that uh, you, uh, you will be welcomed back here again another day. We want to thank you for being here with us today for all that you do and wish you continued success. Thank you, Alan. Thank you again, Premier McGuinty, and thanks once more to the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Ontario, the Carpenters Union, and Campbell Strategies for making this event possible. Your Honour, the second most popular feature of our program is the prize giveaway. And uh, I would like you to draw two names from our bowl of business cards. Uh, our first, thank you, Jennifer. Our first lucky winner will receive a premium bottle of 100% Ontario wine. The Foreign Affair Winery, owned by Len Crispino, is the only winery in North America to produce all of its wines, red and white, in the rich tradition reminiscent of Italy's great Amarones. 
Thanks to Len, who is with us today, we have had a bottle, bottle of this fabulous wine to give away at every Canadian club event this, uh, this season. Thank you very much, Len. And from the Ontario Trillium Foundation, Sandra Crickshanks. <laughs> Congratulations, Sandra. Our second winner will receive a copy of The High Road by Terry Fallis, this year's winner of Canada Reads. This prize is courtesy of Books for Citizens, supported by Samara, a charitable organization that works to strengthen Canada's democracy. And the winner of the book from the Human Resources Professionals Association, J. Scott Allenson. Congratulations to both of you. Okay, so um, before we adjourn for lunch, I'd like to list a few upcoming events at the Canadian Club of Toronto. On April 18th, we feature the Honourable Kathleen Wynne, Ontario's Minister of Transportation. That's this coming Monday. On April 27th, we will join forces once again with Equal Voice to spotlight women in politics at the sixth annual Women in Public Life Luncheon. This year's keynote speaker and EVE Award winner will be Isabel Bassett, former Minister of Citizenship, Culture and Recreation with the Government of Ontario. On May 9th, Kevin Williams, President and Managing Director of GM Canada, will discuss the transformation underway at the new GM, including the innovations required to face tomorrow's challenges. And on May 13th, Frank Stronach, Founder and Chairman of Magna International Inc. will speak at our podium. To order tickets to these or any Canadian Club events, please visit our website at canadianclub.org. This concludes our television programming, which will be broadcast on Rogers TV in the days to come. We are grateful to Rogers TV and 680 News for their continuing promotion of Canadian Club events. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you're hungry. Uh, please stand me uh, before we eat and join me in, please stand, sorry, and join me in a toast to Canada. That's what you get for improvising. To Canada. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>